the subconsciousness of belief. The world has long laboured under the delusion that belief is something that is produced by reason, that it is something ground out of a logic mill, that it is the result of examining evidence. As a matter of fact, what we really believe has little or nothing to do with our intellectual conclusions. Belief is the peculiar liquor that exudes from practice. It is the juice of what we do. It is that condition of the mind and heart that results from the performances of the will. Teachers, preachers, institutions, and the whole earth ignore this truth, though it is plain as the nose on one's face. It is they who do the Ten Commandments that believe in them. They who love believe in love. The virtuous believe in virtue. Worshippers believe in God. The industrious believe in industry. As for them that say they believe in what they do not practice, they simply use the wrong word. They fancy. They conceive. They do not believe. Giving intellectual assent to a thing is not belief, nor like it. Our real creed lies deep in the subconsciousness. It is the deposit of the volitional stream that passes through the mind. The United States does not go to church as much as did the Middle Ages, but we have a deal more faith in what the church is supposed to stand for, righteousness. Bagahot says that medieval Christianity was occupied largely in fighting and even dying for principles which it was utterly careless about putting into practice. A man. I will describe a man for you and ask you what you think of him. His father was a stonecutter and his mother a midwife. Till the age of 35, he made a poor living at his father's trade. Then he quit work and took to the noble occupation of loafing. He was a great talker. He roamed the streets and conversed with anybody who would stop and listen, whether a rich man or poor, a wise man, a noble man, a tramp, or a woman of no reputation. He was easily the ugliest man in town. He was fat, and who respects a fat man? He had a short bull neck, a round and bald head, snub nose, thick lips, and lobster eyes. He loved jokes, and his wit often ran as close to the soil as that of Rabelais or of Lincoln. He was not a nice gentleman. In fact, he was coarse. Having but one pair of shoes, he never wore them, but went barefoot summer and winter. His only garment was generally soiled. He was not sensitive, but said that his nose being turned upward, he could smell better, his eyes protruding, he could see on all sides, and his lips being so thick, they were the better for kissing. He never made over fifty dollars a year, and refused the money his friends offered him for fear he would grow fatter if he were wealthier. He married the worst shrew in the place, who often led him home by the ear, rated him with her tongue, and belaboured him with a broomstick. Now, who was this ne'er-do-well, this Salinas who could drink the stoutest topers under the table, this ignoramus who always professed to know nothing at all? His name was Socrates. He had the greatest brain ever housed in a human body. No man, says Grote, has ever arisen who could draw the bow of Socrates, the father of philosophy and the greatest of all thinkers. Hard Words Voltaire spoke of those who employ speech only to conceal their thoughts, and the same has been said by another author. While this is sometimes true of short words, it is always true of long words. There are enough plain, brief words in common use to describe anything, provided the speaker understands his subject. When one does not know and wants to make others think he knows, then it is the time to use words with which your listeners are unfamiliar. For instance, when the physician does not wish you to know what ails you, he will speak of your exanthematous trouble, and say he is giving you a detergent. He uses these terms because they are politer than to say, "'Twas brillig." If he had told you you had a breaking out, 
and he would give you something to clean you up, you would have understood, which is bad for you. For those who strive to please, long words are useful. As a rule, they are soft. Their very sound flatters those who do not comprehend them. As a modern essayist writes, the long words are not the hard words. It is the short words that are hard. Moreover, the common run of folk think brief words a little vulgar. To retire is much more elegant than to go to bed. A bishop or a gentleman may say execrate. Only low people curse. I once had a wise and honest teacher. I asked him one day to explain a certain matter, and he replied, I haven't time now. If I knew it thoroughly, I could tell you in a few minutes, but as I know it only imperfectly, it would take me an hour. The Call I am a firm believer in the call. Sometime in every man's life, and perhaps repeatedly during years, comes an inner impulse to some noble work, and an outer opportunity to indulge the impulse. He has the chance and the desire. Then is the time for him to arise and go. Let him leave the plough in the field and run. Those who resist the call always regret it. Nature has put into each soul a task for some one part of the world's work. Better starve doing the thing you want to do, than get rich and fat doing what your soul loathes. When Joan of Arc heard the voices in Domremy calling her to battle, she might have said, but who will tend my sheep? When Jenny Lind heard the call to sing, she might have said, but who will do my knitting? There are plenty calls to knit and herd. No man has a right to preach when he had rather be farming, or to teach school when what he most longs for is making money, or to sell goods when he feels he ought to write. Life is too short to keep on treading the wrong road. Possibly, of course, you may be mistaken. You may think you are an actor when you really are a born farmer. You may imagine you can write stories when you can only sell dry goods. But I say it is better to fail at working out the instinct nature put into you than to be a miserable success at what you hate. Don't be hasty, but be true to yourself. Don't fight your lifelong against your deepest convictions. Values The greatest fault with many persons is their inability to estimate values. The best wisdom is to know what is worthwhile and what is not. A businessman works away at his desk while he ought to be outdoors somewhere saving his life. By and by, some fatal disease comes along and removes him. He worked harder to make money for his family than to preserve himself for his family. Many a woman knits and darns and scrubs herself out of the life and sympathy of her husband and children. More than one man has neglected his wife for his career, only to find too late that he gained the shell and lost the kernel. The tendency of every institution is to grow into the habit of overestimating details. The Pharisees were so busy safeguarding their formalities that they could not see the vital truth of Jesus. When your little six-year-old girl comes into your study, would it not be better to lay aside your books? When your faithful clerk is sick, would it not be a good investment in eternal values to take the time to visit him? These human values, love, kindness, friendliness, cheer, health, faith, and the like, are apt to be obscured by profits and pleasure and ambition and the institution. But in our quiet moments or on our sickbed, when the soul's eyes are opened, we see more clearly. We have but a little while to live here, and it pays to learn the higher values and to go in for them. For what shall it profit a man if he accumulate a bushel of chaff and lose the handful of grain?